Hello everybody, um, thanks for joining us today for our webinar, How to Overcome This Year's Biggest Digital Challenges to Ensure a Successful 2017. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. If you do have any issues with the audio at all, please just talk to us in the, um, the chat or ask a question and we'll uh, make sure that's fixed. So I'm Lucy and I'm going to be very shortly handing you over to Ross, um, who is our Solutions Engineer and also the presenter of today's webinar. Um, so Ross is going to be discussing some of this year's biggest challenges and he'll be looking at ways that you can overcome them to ensure that you have a successful 12 months. Um, if, you, if you do have any questions about the slides or the topics we're discussing during the webinar, then please feel free to submit them using the question box and we'll try to answer as many of them as possible at the end of the webinar. And if we don't answer your question today, then we'll definitely make sure that we follow up with email after. So um, Ross, it's over to you. Thanks, Lucy. Hello, everyone. So let's start by introducing the key themes. So first we've got advertising adversity. We'll be looking at the impact of social media, the current state of advertising for publishers and the future itself. Then we'll be on to saving subscriptions, which will be the long-term challenges of engaging millennials and Generation Z, the use of social media as a publishing platform, converting its users into subscribers and the membership model. Then it's beat the blockers, where we're looking at the different strategies publishers have adopted and the best way to combat the increasing use of ad blockers. Then it's captivating content, so the best practices for engaging with your users through optimizing for mobile, offering personalized content, push notifications, engaging beyond your content, and user-generated content. And then finally, we're going to look at the future, and we'll be introducing some of the future opportunities that publishers are going to have in, that, in the publishing space. The first up is advertising adversity. So Ross is going to be looking at various advertising models, the role of social media in the publishing world. So Ross, it's, uh, we're ready to go. So with, with free access titles like The Daily Mirror and The Guardian, they've recorded readership growth of 101% and 98.5% respectively. During that same period, titles that had a digital paywall like The Times and The Sun recorded growth of 5.05% and 6.9% respectively clearly demonstrating a significant growth in the readership over the paywall model. And uh, just as a caveat, the Sun has now dropped the paywall. In this section, we're going to be looking at the CPM advertising metric in its measurement and future compatibility, the takeover of social media and how publishers can compete by growing their audiences. And then we'll be looking at the relatively new CPH metric and, how, and, and the advertising opportunities that publishers are going to uh, that aren't currently they aren't currently put, taking full advantage of. So declining CPMs. Publishers have seen ad revenues dropping in both print and digital, leading to losses in revenue, made even worse by declining print circulation. And you, you don't want to be in a race to the bottom. So how can we create more premium advertising opportunities to reverse the decline? How can you prove to advertisers uh, that they are getting a strong return on investment compared to print? Well, we can offer them premium bundled ads across print and digital for special events, increasing the value of them while potentially charging more. We've got native adverts with premium content, and they'll play a pivotal role for publishers, and this is an area that we're also going to focus on heavily today. Ultimately, publishing brands should be more valuable than the average website due to the quality of the content, so maybe CPM is no longer the best metric. It doesn't take into account the value of the brand or the engagement the reader has with the ad. With measurement and data problems, print doesn't give anything like the tracking that you get from digital, yet digital is so heavily scrutinized. With digital publishing, advertisers can see real-time stats on impressions and click-throughs. As this is being undervalued by advertisers, it's another negative against CPM, the CPM metric. With social media takeover, social media platforms have been able to capture a lot of ad spend because major media groups and advertisers are prepared to pay a premium for exposure to large audiences. They now dominate classified and display ads, which used to account for a large proportion of print, and print ad revenue. Publishers can fight back by creating premium advertising opportunities, utilizing the advantage of having both print and digital mediums with bundled ad opportunities across both for special events and promotions, they should also be able to push native advertising with premium content. 
Social media networks have their own agenda, and we use the quality content that's been created by publishers like an, ag like an aggregator to strengthen their own engagement and offering. Back in 2014, Norwegian publishers came together to try and, and compete with their own advertising platform versus Facebook. There's, also, there's always audience at scale, which we looked at initially. So some publishers have adopted this strategy of growing their audiences at scale to combat the advantage that social media networks have in attracting the attention of advertisers. The Daily Mail, The Guardian, and The Washington Post have all tried to grow as much global traffic as possible. And the Daily Mail has now become the world's biggest brand, media brand with particularly impressive exposure in the US, UK, and Australia. With the Daily Mail product, the only paywall you'll actually find is on their digital edition page turner. And the Telegraph recently switched from this model to a new model which has a balance between free and premium content. And the premium content tends to be focused around uh, your long-form articles. So let's look at some of the stats. The Smarto mobile ad platform, so its total ad spend split between 62% on apps and 38% on mobile web. So the mobile web is still pretty far behind, but it's doing better than it was in 2014 when the breakdown was 72% for apps versus 28% for mobile web a clear sign of, of the value of the app. By 2019, mobile ad spending will rise to $65.87 billion, or 72.2% of total digital ad spend. It's also worth thinking about the context of the ad. The San Francisco Chronicle was able to double its CPM rates by aligning ads with the content uh, and positively targeting the category and keywords. And then the chart that we have here in front of us uh, this illustrates the problem that publishers are facing with the decline of, of advertising revenue. And, uh, ever since uh, 2000, it's, it's almost dropped off a cliff. So we, we've got to try and combat that. So CPH. CPH, to the, to the best of my knowledge at least, first came along with the Financial Times, and it's since been adopted by Build in Germany, the Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, and The Economist. CPM values impressions equally regardless of the brand, so it's not as valuable to the bigger brands with higher engagement. Some of these brands receive 40 plus minutes average engagement at peak times. So looking, looking at the time-based advertising with CPH, what are the key areas? So you, the first one is you've got guaranteed reach. CPH allows the publisher to sell blocks of audience time to advertisers with the guarantee that the client will only be charged for ads that are seen for more than five seconds of active time with 100% viewability. The maximum time per view is 30 seconds because beyond this there is no extra recall from the end user and it keeps it fairer for the advertiser. The next key point is the demonstrable impact. Readers who see an ad for five seconds or more are up to 50% more likely to display familiarity and association with a brand. There's hyper-targeted campaigns. So when you combine your CPH with a subscription-based model, advertisers can take advantage of the subscriber data to run highly targeted campaigns across their audience. With the examples I've mentioned today, these are far-reaching, influential, and global audiences. And then the final key point, most cost-effective campaign options. Studies have shown that the CPH offers greater value for money to an advertiser over CPM. As, the, as their ads receive 10% more viewing time uh, when compared to the CPM uh, campaign of the same spend. This also doesn't take into account the value of that viewing time as it's for a minimum of five seconds. So here we have some, uh, here, here's a range of some of the ad types supported by page suites. It's worth considering the types of ads being used. So to, to use some examples, uh, an MPU ad would generate roughly four times as many click-throughs as a banner ad. We, we, we conducted a customer survey and we found that interstitials and page zero ads struck the best balance between not being too intrusive while offering the greatest exposure. Pop-up ads, on the other hand, were found to be the most intrusive and therefore not necessarily worth their CPM value due to the risk of upsetting readers. And 
While banner ads were considered to be the most unintrusive, they were also considered unengaging as well. So with native advertising, 40% of those surveys stated that they felt less inclined to block native ads, and some ad blockers actively tried to allow native ads. An AOP report found that the native ads are significantly more in fact impactful than traditional ads. Not only were they more interesting, eye-catching, and more informative than standard display ads, they also generated 31% more clicks. Native ad spending on mobile is forecast to reach 8.8 .8 billion euros across Europe by 2020, almost six times the 1.5 billion euros spent in 2015. Social media platforms will be a major growth factor, driving more than 300% growth in native social network advertising in the same period. So native advertising, this represents an opportunity to take things take back from social networks. Social networks don't have journalists or the resources to generate native adverts. So this is a big opportunity that publishers need to grab. So we briefly touched there on a range of different advertising options and I know that I'm particularly intrigued to see how more publishers adopt the CPH metric. Um, but moving on to this next section, we're going to be looking at saving subscriptions. So we're going to be looking at paid content versus advertising, various publishing platforms such as Google, AMP, and we're also going to look a little more closely at some of the subscription models that are being used by publishers right now. According to the International News Media Association, 73% of newspapers worldwide now have some form of paywall. In a survey of publishers by News Cycle, 37% of respondents felt that readers would pay for a subscription to their news site if the site contained no ads. Another 23% said that readers would pay for a light ad site limited to perhaps four ads per page. Afton Bredet in Sweden, Build in Germany, the Financial Times and the Salt Lake Tribune are all offering paid for products that guarantee either limited or no advertising. We're going to be looking at the long-term challenge of engaging with generations Y and Z, the use of social media as a publishing platform and, and converting its users into subscribers and the membership model, the pros and cons of taking advantage of the different platforms available to increase uh, brand exposure and more effective methods for converting these consumers into new subscribers and then we'll finish off with the six different business models for content gating and how some brands are using a membership model to draw consumers uh, and we'll be creating perceived added value. So one of the biggest current and future challenges facing publishers is its need to attract members of generations Y and Z, generation Y also known as the millennials. These are people who have and are growing up in a world when Newsprint is no longer dominating journalism like it used to. They have easy access to the internet, which is full of free content, and they've taken this for granted. Newspapers and Education is a program that's been heavily adopted in the US, and it gives access to schools so newspapers can get their content in front of this next generation of consumers. Publishers can use social media to increase the exposure to its brand. The downside is that the engagement rarely, rarely goes beyond the R school in question. There, there has also been recent growth in the circulation of fake news articles, particularly regarding the recent presidential election. It's actually devalued the credibility of social media, but on the plus side, the public are quite aware of this, and it actually increases the credibility of the traditional brand. So it works in our favor. Social networks have tried to make it as easy as possible for publishers to publish their content on their networks and in an optimized way. Snapchat Discover presents content really nicely, but it isn't possible to monetize this network, and it works best when trying to get short messages across through video animation. It's not ideal for quality long-form journalism. Google claims that AMP pages load four times faster and use 10 times less data than a standard web page. Facebook says that instant articles load up to 10 times faster and that they're being shared 15% more than a standard web page. The large audiences these networks provide have led to the promise of premium advertising rates of between $8 and $10 CPMs. And while not always accurate, there are many cases where this is being achieved. 
This is realistic because Facebook is able to profile its users so well. They know so much about everyone and, and this allows them to use targeted ads. Publishers get 100% of the revenue from ads if they sell the ads themselves and Facebook take a 30% cut if they provide the ads. However, it's not all positive. How much exposure does this actually is this actually providing and how aware are the consumers of the article source? Does this type of consumer even care about the source of the article? We have to question the value that this offers publishers because in most cases we're seeing very little conversion from the initial instant article. Typical audience conversion is around 1.1 to 1.2 impressions from that initial article. So you could argue it's just a one hit wonder. Are publishers helping Facebook to become a global editor for all news and to become an aggregator of all content? Is this just fueling the growth of Facebook with limited returns to the publisher? Is Facebook in a position to abuse its position and promote certain topics and censor others? In 2006, there was a famous case where Facebook censored an article by a Norwegian publisher on the Vietnam War because it contained an image that displayed nudity. And, and the final point worth making with, with this is, this content is hard to monetize, which represents an added dilemma for publishers operating a paid for business model. And they're seeing especially little conversion to subscribers. So far, we've mainly focused on using advertising as a means for generating revenue. We're now going to focus on converting readers to paid for subscribers. It's important to give new readers time, allowing them to familiarize themselves with your brand, decide if they like the style of journalism, agree with the views expressed and, the va and, and also value the brand. It's important that the reader can form a habit of using you as a go-to source of content. The more that the reader is able to do these things, the more likely they are to become a subscriber. There are very few brands that can get away with giving, with giving no content away for free especially in the B2C sector. So what are our options for controlling the flow of free content to readers? We can give a, a time-based free trial, perhaps 7 or 14 days. Publishers could limit the number of free articles a reader can consume per month. Certain categories of content that are perceived as being more valuable than others can be gated, while free access can be given to others. And finally, Articles can be broken up into categories of premium and non-premium, with premium being mainly the highest quality long-form articles, pieces or exposés. A common choice is for feed-based content to be given away for free and to put the digital edition e-paper behind a paywall. If a publisher does wish to do that and to provide limited access to their digital editions, then this can be done on a per-page, article or time basis. We have different examples of, of the different options available that range from a fully locked down solution to completely open access. The Newsday apps are fully locked down to subscribers, but optimum Wi-Fi users also get access. The TV branch of Newsday, News 12, that New, Newsday subscribers get access to this along with Comcast and Time Warner Cable TV subscribers. The Sun and the Daily Mail group give free access to all their web content but have a hard paywall on their standalone e-paper apps. Keska Sumalainen and Media Talo in Finland have a balance between free and premium content. The Wall Street Journal will perhaps give you uh, the headline and maybe the first paragraph, and the rest of the article will be grayed out. Trump titles like the, Ch the Chicago Tribune and the Orlando Sentinel will give you metered access on an article basis. The Boston Globe will give you a time-based free trial. And another option that's not on this list is giving free access in exchange for data, whether it's social sign-in, or it could be a, a survey form, or it could even be a quiz that, that might be uh, driven by an appetizer. They're, they're all options that are open. So I put this graph in here because it, it, it nicely illustrates the value of, of a digital product and especially what the pulling power you get when you combine that with a print and digital subscription. And we're seeing regardless of the size of publication, although especially with the larger ones, 
um, it, it's a really big growth area. There are a number of brands that have sought to create a membership-based model rather than a traditional subscription. They do this by taking their core product and adding value with minimum additional outlay. The New York Times offers members of its premier product two ebooks a month, behind the scenes accounts from their reports, and exclusive video content. The National Journal offers corporate memberships, which include an ad free experience, invitations to exclusive events, interaction with reporters, exclusive access to National Journal toolbooks, and a weekly briefing of analysis and summaries. Condé Nast. Ars Technica offers similar benefits plus interaction with industry experts and exclusive coupons. The Telegraph has partnered with the Washington Post to provide their subscribers access to the Post content as part of their membership model. The Guardian are also incentivizing membership with unique perks like invitations to events and the possibility of meeting with journalists. Publishers can reserve some content so that it's exclusively for members only, even if they have a tiered approach that includes subscription packages. By, by utilizing existing content, publishers can create sub-brands to add value and increase engagement. While not working with a membership model, Newsday and the Dallas Morning News deliver specialist sports products, which users can personalize to their teams, and in the case of Newsday Sports, journalists as well. The Guardian membership model is focused on building a community where customers can express their loyalty, and this works for them uh, because typically speaking, their readers have been long-standing customers whose values align uh, very closely with the brand. When setting up a membership product, one of the first questions a publisher must ask itself is how it can make the most from its intrinsic assets, like these publishers have to maximize perceived value. So I think that was a, a really interesting look at the variety of subscription models which are being utilized by publishers across the world. Um, this next section I think is probably one of the, the biggest topics of the year and perhaps one of the biggest challenges that many publishers have had to face um, and that's ad blockers. So Ross is now going to look at how some newspaper groups are tackling ad blockers, the role of the in-house sales teams and ways that you can combat declining ad revenue. Ad blocker Shine Technologies claim that mobile ads consume up to half of users' mobile data allowance, and this is the main complaint we get from consumers. Studies have shown that a typical website could take between 8 and 11 seconds to, mo to, to load. When you introduce an ad blocker, the load time can drop to as low as 2 seconds. This is because many sites are set up to load the ads first, and these ads often have additional attachments like analytics. All these extra lines of code and files can equate to between 18 and 79% of the total data. And all this extra data has even more impact on 2G or 3G wireless networks in less developed countries or in more rural areas. There have been cases where as little as 20% of the data has actually been from the publisher's content. According to PageFair's 2016 ad blocking report, over 300 million people are using ad blocking software on desktop and mobile. Ad blockers are particularly popular in China, India, and Indonesia, but Europeans and Americans have been comparatively slow adopters. And there are 60 times more ad blocking browsers being used in China than there are in the US. And to give you those numbers for comparison, in China there are 116 million, and in the US there's 1.7 million. And to compare that, the UK, UAE, France and Germany each have around 1 million in use. I ran an experiment with a number of major publishing brands in Europe and the US to see how many ads they were actually displaying. In the most extreme example, I was able to detect 30 ads, but many had 20 or more. So let's look at some of the different strategies publishers have adopted and the best ways to combat the increasing usage of ad blockers. We saw earlier that there are many different publishers that don't require a subscription to access their online content, meaning that their only source of digital revenue is from advertising. Subsequently, there are a number of different strategies being adopted to combat the use of ad blockers. There are those like uh, Build from Axel Springer in Germany, Equip in France, CTM in the UK, Forbes, Condé Nast, and Gruner and Yar back in Germany, 
that have a no nonsense tolerance to ad blockers and they won't let any ad blocking users near their site. Build have reported that since they, they introduced this measure, two thirds of users have switched off their ad blocker rather than paying for the privilege of using it. The Parisian have, re have resorted to a polite request to, to, for people to turn their ad blocker off. Le, Le Monde and The Guardian have supported messages and these tend to be from their, the, uh, the editor or the CEO and it explains the value of the quality of journalism and how they need the advertising to fund it. And then there's a the short term banding together option. So uh, Swedish publishers along with AIB Sweden joined together to, to completely block ad, ad blockers from, from their sites for a whole month to study the effects and we're still waiting to see that, the results from that data. According to a study by Pagefair, it's estimated that, tw in, that in 2015, $22 billion was lost in advertising revenue. But it's not just the ad revenue that's being lost. The tracking cookies that are also being lost, uh, so this means that publishers are no longer getting that data about people visiting, visiting their site. And ironically, that's a key component when trying to sell to advertisers. And the chart that we have here, this is just to illustrate the growth that we've, that we've seen in, in, uh, in ad blocking usage. So we've seen a broad range of ways that publishers are tackling ad blocking and it's not something that can be ignored. This is a, a particularly affecting all size publishers, but, but large publishers can, can overcome this by combining native advertising utilizing their in-house ad sales team and taking advantage of apps as they're currently protected. But it's the mid-sized publishers that are going to be hit the hardest. The decline in programmatic ad serving will hit them uh, the most and could threaten their, their, their actual existence as this constitutes a large proportion of their revenue. Small publishers will have a slight advantage over the mid-sized publishers as they've got comparatively lower overhead and are less dependent on programmatic ad revenue. And then just to highlight some of the key areas, uh, as we saw earlier, there are publishers that are, that are serving ad-free versions for subscribers. You, you can generate greater CPM values by targeting users based on their profile. We can offer metered, metered access. So in, instead of selling a subscription, we might sell bundles of, of articles at 20 articles per time, and it works almost on a token metric. So the end user only pays for the article that they consume. We, as you've seen, many publishers are, are completely blocking the use of ad blockers. And then there's also the option, which we've touched on a little bit, where we give free access in exchange for data. And there's different types of data that we can gather there. Finally, app-only content could be a big way forward. Remember, apps are currently protected, so publishers may choose to provide app exclusive content as a softer approach. This, this is a, a nice way of drawing our users into the app environment where, where we can combine those higher quality ads that are perhaps native ads and also your premium content that they might not necessarily get anywhere else. So I think our, our final section is on captivating content and really it, it ties up and is a solution for many of the problems that we've discussed today. So we're going to be looking at the importance of driving engagement across desktop, tablet and mobile. We'll be looking at personalization which has really sort of gained momentum these past six months. User generated content and we will finish off by looking at some of the other innovations that we may see in 2017. As of June this year, 49% of all digital engagement has been through smartphone apps. While this is dominated by the 18 to 44 year olds, there's been a year on year increase for the 55 to 64 year old category of 37%. And this has now reached 55.6 hours per month. These numbers are, are large across the board, but it, it's quite interesting to see the lack of decline across the, age, uh, across the older age groups. And we're seeing that this is leveling out more and more as time goes on. In retail, we're seeing significantly higher engagement through mobile app over web by a ratio of seven to one. The key takeaway is that end users will use mobile web as a quick access of information rather than consuming large amounts of content. A lot of this usage will be based on location and purchasing decisions. 
Apps, on the other hand, are a lot more focused on engagement. Some clients are seeing 40-minute sessions on tablet in the evening and at weekends. Their smartphone apps are seeing engagement of up to 15 minutes and much more frequent uh, sessions per day rather than the tablet. As crazy as this might sound, 11% of users place a high importance on the look of a logo before placing it on the home screen. 60% of app engagement is spent uh, on social and entertainment based content, whereas only 2% is spent on pure publishing based apps. So, by publishing content to social media, are we not just making this worse? The next two graphs, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the next two graphs from Localytics illustrate the value of having engaging solutions. The example here shows the different levels of engagement based on how the user has ranked your app. While the top five is dominated by social media, publishers should be aiming for their products to be within the top 10. Key tactics for increasing the rank of your app would be to offer end user personalization, careful use of notifications, and to utilize interactive elements, which we'll see a lot more of in the coming slides. Here are the top five reasons why consumers stop using an app. And it, it fits nicely that almost all these reasons can be addressed uh, by having a highly engaging product. Nobody wants to forget, oh, nobody's going to forget about or get bored of an app. If it's personalized, they can play Sudoku and they can check their horoscopes. Your quality content alone may not be enough. As mobile app is now responsible for 58.4% of all media usage time, it's so important to have an optimized product. 25% of, of apps are only used once and 58% of users will churn in the first 30 days of using an app. 75% will leave within the first three months. So it's, a, it's so important to be optimized for these devices, but especially smartphones. The Boston Globe and the Standard in Belgium both have fully branded solutions, including their own fonts. The standard even has full control of their CSS for its article views, so they can make instant changes. And it's just worth emphasizing the importance of brand familiarization and identity. And uh, you can see the article views uh, as part of the visual there. The killer feature in the Newsday setup is, is their engaging image galleries. The, these image galleries are overlaid on top of the page turner and in many cases, there's 30 plus images for each one. It's content the publisher already has, and it's a great way of uh, engaging with the end users, and it's by far one of their most popular features. They've also been able to monetize this by having a DFP uh, full, full screen interstitial be inserted within the flow, so it's win-win all round. And that's just one of a range of advertising options that's available. It's also worth taking into account the analytics side because you're getting better measurement of the individual article performance. And this is also great in terms of editorial feedback and something you'd never get with the print version. According to Flurry, apps featuring personalization capabilities saw their sessions balloon more than 332% in 2015. While a large part of this can be attributed to entertainment style apps, there's no question of its unilateral value. There are a number of ways we can offer end users a personalized experience. The London Evening Standard allows its users to organize the content sections and even hide the ones that aren't of interest. In the Newsday app, users can specify which content categories the user will receive notifications from. So if you're not interested in politics, you don't have to hear about politics. Newsday sports users can follow their favorite sports teams and journalists. They've identified that college and high school sports are highly popular with their readership and they're offering hyper-local content through the high school sports channel. There is an argument that this could be to the detriment of the curated experience. It's subsequently possible to anchor certain sections and stories that a publisher may want, and you might want to do this for editorial or revenue reasons. And both the London Evening Standard and Newsday are, are doing just that. 
While news consumption is relatively consistent throughout the day, it peaks slightly between 8 p.m. and midnight. This makes notification timing less significant for featured art, for featured content, and it shows that using push notifications for breaking content can drive traffic at any time. The challenge with push notifications is to not over-abuse the function to, and to the point where the end user turn, either turns off the feature or deletes the app. Notifications need to either be insightful or offer value. For years, we've been used to reaching out to readers with text-based notifications, but there are now more options available. We can target subscribers based on their location and or with rich media messages. In the future, this could be a huge advertising, but I think this would only work if it's highly targeted and if the user's opted in. And I think the best way uh, to position this would be uh, through promotions or discounts at, at nearby retailers. So for example, if you're at a sports venue, send a discount voucher uh, from a local restaurant for after the game. That could be a good option. Users of the Newsday app can follow a developing story and automatically receive updates as it unfolds. So besides your content, what are the best options for increasing engagement levels with your readers? The London Evening Standard are using crosswords, Sudoku, and weather content as their engagement pieces. With the crosswords, they're seeing average engagement times of eight minutes per day from the people that use them. Users of the Newsday app can monitor traffic alerts and view traffic cameras in real time. And the Belfast Telegraph app provides users with horoscopes and a TV guide. This really is a big opportunity to set yourself apart from the other brands in your market and to give your app an extra USP. We have to remember that we're competing for your audience's attention with more than just other publishers. There are a number of reasons why it's worth considering user-generated content as a feature of your app. It allows you to build a closer re relationship with your audience and increase engagement. Your readers are increasingly mobile, and as, as your newsrooms get smaller, readers that witness newsworthy events could help your brand to break the story first. It could be a source of 24-7 content generation while enhancing your app's feature set. E-commerce brand engagement increases an average of 28% of when users are exposed to a combination of user-created product videos and professional content. From a publishing perspective, uh, the results aren't quite as dramatic, but it, it does demonstrate the potential. 72% of brands that utilize user-generated content believe that it helps them to engage with their audience. And millennials believe that user-generated content is 35% more memorable than, than other media, and it's 50% more trustworthy. And finally, to, to take a look at the future, while there may be a number of major challenges facing publishers both now and in the future, technology is advancing all the time and could create a number of opportunities. Text to speech is a, bit, is a big growth area, particularly for commuting. And when combined with other technologies like Alexa and driverless car, cars, many cars already have large tablet style consoles with, with app capabilities. I, I recently met with a publisher that was discussing the idea of of utilizing a, a text-to-speech function which would allow them to, the user to select the articles they want to hear and then as they commute, the app just reads those articles to them. We're already developing uh, TV apps for Apple TV and we see virtual reality as a potential growth area as well. And the, the graph that we've got here is a, is a really nice demonstration of, of what consumers are looking for moving forward. And most of these points have actually been addressed with some of the options that we've got uh, or that we've previously presented. Yeah, so just to jump in on this slide, I think the points in this graph definitely hint towards um, a more personalized future with users seeking content that is more specific to what, to what they want from their app solution or digital solution. Um, so thanks, Ross, and thank everybody for joining us. We hope you found it insightful. Um, as I said at the beginning of the webinar, we will be circulating a copy of this recording so that you can watch sections of it back or forward it on to um, other colleagues. Um, 
So we have had some questions that have been submitted. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask them now. Um, we'll try and fit in as many as we can, and if we don't get back to you, then we'll make sure we follow up on email. Um, okay, so one of the questions we've been asked is, which ad blocking model is working the best? So I think, Ross, you discussed five or six different ad blocking models. Yeah, there's, there's quite a few, and it, it, it's not the same answer for everyone. It's, uh, different solutions would work better for others. So for major titles like Build, they, they can get away with, with putting up a brick wall against ad blockers, and if you're using an ad block and not letting, letting anyone in, whereas the smaller titles that, that have perhaps more competition in their market, they might need to take a softer approach. Okay. Um, another question here says, what are your thoughts on virtual reality? <laughs> so I think that's quite an interesting concept. Obviously, it's still relatively new, and we know that some publishers have begun exploring it. So, yeah, what, what do you think? So we're still researching VR. Um, one thing that we, we've learned so far is that it's perhaps the, the most engaging medium available. So trying to incorporate that for publishers is going to be a, a little challenge for us, but it could be a massive growth area. Okay. Yeah, I think next year will definitely be interesting to see to see where publishers take that. Um, someone says, so um, isn't personalising content going to be really resource heavy? Uh, no, it, it shouldn't. It shouldn't be at all. Uh, the way we would build build an app in this case, for example, uh, there's actually no additional resource. The the effort is on our part in the initial setup, but from the publisher perspective, perspective, there's no extra work. And if you want to implement solutions such as weather feeds or traffic cameras, is, is that sort of time uh, resource heavy? Uh, again, no, no resource. It would be something that, that we'd plug in. Um, it's, it's not something the publisher themselves would have to look at. Um, there's another one here about so the types of apps. So what trends are you seeing with regards to publishers creating separate apps, uh, sorry, separate apps for feed and PDF content, so um, I'll let you answer that one. So up until a couple of years ago, there, there was a quite a, and I, this may have been down to the, the providers, but there was quite a trend to have separate apps, so one for the e-edition e replica and one for the feed, and now that technology is advanced, um, we've got a lot more of the engaging pieces that you've seen, like uh, the third party integrations and the crosswords and uh, all, all that other stuff um, that you've seen here, we can create like a, uh, it's almost like an, an all-in-one uh, super app for publishers, and it means that you've got one app on the on the on the home screen that you have, you don't have to worry about the two. Uh, it's going to be slightly less memory as well, and uh, you don't have to keep going backwards and forwards between them. So, uh, in the last two years, I'd say there's been a big movement towards one singular app. And I guess as well from a user's perspective, it, it means that they don't have to go and open up two separate apps. I think people only use five or six apps, so you, you're going to be competing for their time as well. So I think that's really why the two-in-one app concept is, is gaining momentum. Um, okay, I've got another question, which is, how do these trends impact niche publishers versus much of today's presentation? Obviously, we discussed um, sort of larger publishers, mm -hmm. so how does that affect smaller publishers or niche publishers? So Niche publishers, if anything, have a stronger advantage because from an advertising perspective, that there's a lot more that they can do if they can work with advertisers to work on um, uh, engaging, uh, engaging native ads and to utilize them quite heavily. Uh, they can actually generate more revenue. So uh, in terms of, uh, uh, to use an example, a, a farming publication, uh, if, if, if you've got uh, a, a niche farming uh, title, you, you might have engaging native ads with, uh, uh, that, that John Deere might look to do with you. So uh, from, from an advertising perspective, you, you could have more options available. Um, I would also imagine that they might be slightly suscept uh, less susceptible to uh, people using ad blockers because these ads are generally uh, more targeted because there's, there's a, a general niche uh, area of focus or a niche niche area of interest. Okay, thank you. Um, I, th I think we're done then. We've, we've answered all of the questions. If you do think of anything else that you want to ask us about any of the topics that we've discussed today, then please just contact us. You can email us on hello at pagesuite.com and we'll make sure those emails go to the right people. Um, 
As I said, we will be sending a recording, and uh, thank you once again for joining us. Yeah, thank you.